Dream Chronicles Fiction The Apostle of Insanity Trilogy Volume 2 Frenzy by John Allen Price Chapter 8 Mr. Hart, welcome back to Station Grace THX said the senior coordinating officer when the large group of civilian and military officers entered his tactical center. Have you been following the updates on the operation? Except for the last 15 minutes, Hart replied, visibly relieved to be out of the oppressive heat and humidity he encountered on his trip from the helipad. What's happened? Has there been any problems with the battle station in District Landis? Asked Noah Wood, being more specific. No, sir. They stopped arguing with us over command jurisdiction more than an hour ago, said the coordinating officer. We now have complete operational control. Thank you for your assistance, Mr. Wood. You should thank General Powers. He was the one I called. Now, is the operation still on schedule? Yes, sir. Force Trident's gunship has caught up with the tanker and is climbing to rendezvous with it. The deception maneuvers are just beginning. The lead formations are entering Bauhaus air defense radar coverage. The coordinating officer turned to the center's wall of display screens and pointed to the largest one. The tactical map showing the boundary line between two adjoining capital districts and the frontier split between Bauhaus, Imperial, and Cybertronic territories. It also showed the wide swath of Imperial and Capital airspace covered by the Bauhaus air defense net. Just entering the net were the first flights of FA-99, feline multi-purpose fighters. They flew at high altitude and in loose weaving formations that indicated they were acting as air superiority escorts at a more medium altitude, was a far smaller formation of felines operating in the defense suppression and electronic jamming roles. Hugging the terrain, even at their distance, was the largest group of capital aircraft, FA-99s, armed and operating as strike fighters. Very good. To Bauhaus, this will look exactly like a retaliatory strike for the Roswell attack, said Wood standing behind the console's operators. Then he glanced over at Hart, who was still wiping sweat off his neck and face. We must find some way of air conditioning that walk from the helipad to the station. Would it be possible, Mr. Wood? Hart queried, believing the casual remark to be serious. Indeed, I'll mention it at the next building improvement conference. Major, has Bauhaus started to react? Yes, their radars are changing modes, said the coordinating officer. To track while scan, they'll put up their own fighters next, then activate their missile batteries. Soon their attention will be entirely focused on their frontier. While the tactical map showed the wave of fighters continuing to advance on the border, the auxiliary screens on either side of it finally started showing some activity. They recorded the radar stations that were changing modes, the status of the various groups of Capital Air Force, and even which Bauhaus airfields appeared to be readying aircraft for takeoff. On only one of the side screens was displayed the most important part of the operation. Deep in Imperial territory, two symbols were linking up. Mitch, our tanks are nearly full, said Alvarez. I'm breaking the connection. Less than a hundred feet in front of the Cutlass loomed a CCTL-5 cargo troop lifter, normally used as an army assault transport. This version was a tanker variant for the Capital Air Force. Its high crew speed and VTOL characteristics enabled it to refuel a wide variety of combat aircraft, from supersonic fighters to helicopters. Unfortunately, they could only hook up to a single hose and reel unit mounted in its tail because of its diminutive, high-set wings were occupied by massive engine pods. 
A brief plume of fuel spilled from the hose's cone-shaped receptacle a few seconds after Taylor waved to the reel operator to end the transfer. As the fueling probe retracted into a housing beside Taylor's cockpit, Alvarez rolled the gunship to the left and dove for the jungle. It was the first time in over 500 miles the helicopter had climbed higher than 100 feet. Now it was back down on the deck, hugging the treetops as it set course for Imperial's frontier with Bauhaus. And if it all works out, the worst reaction we'll get from Imperial is an official complaint about an unauthorized border violation, Sutter commented. Once the hard maneuvers ended, in a few days' time. Let's hope it goes that way, said Hunter. Bamble, what are you examining? Electronic surveillance readout on Imperial's reaction to us, said the team's other military advisor. He had the roof-mounted terminal at his side of the cabin and was surfing through its tactical displays. They haven't even changed modes on their air defense radar. This warrants... Don't even think about sending a report. Not until we're on departure from the target area. Julia, this is Mitch. Do you have the river yet? Got it in sight, Alvarez responded. Hold on. This looks like it's going to be a fun ride. Apart from the plateau line in the distance, the only major terrain feature in mile after mile of dense jungle was a meandering river. Called the Diana Majoris River, it was one of the largest rivers on Venus. Amazon-like in its vast network of tributaries, it drained the rainforest basin of the southern continent into the great equatorial ocean. Hundreds of miles from its delta, the river snaked its way around the terrain's rolling hills and was wide. Even at this stage in its journey, it was easily wide enough for Alvarez to drop the cutlass over it and fly in its winding course back to its headwaters and deep into Bauhaus territory. Finally, after all this time, our schedules allow us to have lunch together, said Max Steiner, visibly pleased to encounter Anna in the officer's cafeteria. I do hope this chair isn't reserved for someone. No, Maximilian. Lindholm answered, motioning to the empty place beside her. I know you would break away from your duties at this time. Sometimes you're very predictable. Once Steiner sat his tray down, all the seats at the oval-shaped table were filled. Relatively small, the cafeteria was quickly filling with both officers and high-ranking civilian officials. So much so that Steiner soon found it difficult to look out of the room's windows at the base's hangar and flight line. To you, I am always predictable, he said, laying an affectionate hand on one of Lindholm's. I guess that's the way I'll always be. You're predictable to more than just your fiancé, the base administrator quickly added. Pearson sat across from Steiner and had just been finishing his lunch when he arrived. Instead of rising to leave, he stayed in his seat, and his expression took on a cold official look. Your request to do local training flights is on my desk again. This will save me the time of preparing an official reply. Reject it, Capitan, and you'll know the reasons. Max, you didn't, said Lindholm, pulling her hand out of his. You know we must have as little activity at the base as possible. Don't act so surprised, Anna, said Steiner. I thought I was predictable. I examined Aquila's flight logs, and your regular schedule would allow for a few training flights. We can't do anything that will draw attention to ourselves, Kriegler added, barely looking up from his plate. Even this far from the border, Capital can still watch us. I would say permitting absolutely no flying would draw attention to us, Colonel. We should present the appearance of normal activity. If you wish, Capitan, you can fly the transport helicopter when it arrives later, said Pearson. I'm a warrior, not a bus driver, 
Steiner replied, trying to keep the irritation out of his voice. What you're suggesting wouldn't give me the chance to examine the local terrain and decide how to use it should I have to fight here. The virtual reality simulators should allow you to do that, Capitan, said one of the other officials at the table. Dr. Hella Reisner, the middle-aged woman, was Akila's senior doctor and in charge of the VIP's examination. They are rare and expensive machines, brought here specifically for you and your people. I know they are wonderful machines, but they are only as good as their programming. And even with the best, there are drawbacks. Steiner grabbed his fork and plunged it into the middle of his steak then lifted it off his plate. The scientists who work on virtual reality can put me in one of their neurosensor machines and make me believe I'm actually looking at a real steak. It would even smell and taste real, but would it give me the same sensation and nutrition as eating a real one? I don't believe it could. Eating a steak won't get noticed by capital surveillance, said Pearson. Flying a warplane like the Python 100 would. Request denied. Ca yes, what is it? Sorry to disturb you, Mr. Pearson, said the lieutenant, who stepped up to the table, holding his salute until Pearson returned it. But the Armed Forces Command in Heimberg... Reports our southern frontiers were crossed by a force of unidentified aircraft some hours ago. Yes? And what does this have to do with us? Think hard about this, Lieutenant. No need to, sir. After losing track of this force, air defense has since relocated it in our sector and heading straight for us. Where are they and has air defense been able to identify them? Asked Kriegler pushing away his half-finished lunch. Approximately 90 kilometers from us, said the lieutenant, and no one's been able to identify the aircraft. We think they are Mishima, but we are not positive. Looks like I'll be flying whether you want me to or not, said Steiner, taking one large cut out of his steak and wolfing it down before rising. Lieutenant, alert my squadron's personnel. Arm all flyable gunships at once. You're overreacting, Capitan, said Pearson, growing more irritated with the interruption. Wouldn't you like to know who these people are before you intercept them? I'm afraid I must agree with Maximilian, Lindholm advised, also rising from her seat. This is a threat no matter who it is. Max, I'll get one of the portable links from operations and meet you at the hangar. Good luck. Captain, your catnap's over, said Wendy, raising her soft voice until it could be heard above the muted thumping of the helicopter's rotor blades. Something's up. I'm never going to get any sleep, Hunter mumbled, rubbing his eyes, then his stiff neck. We're still a couple of minutes from the drop time. What's going on? It's Jeff and Julia. They say something strange is happening in the target area. I don't like this. The last time Julia told us something strange was happening was when this whole crazy ride started. Hunter slipped his intercom headset back into his ears while the terminal was rolled down to him. Its screen was a view of the helicopter's forward infrared scanners adjusted to compensate for the jungle's heat. It nonetheless showed intense heat sources floating on the horizon. Only after he plugged in did Hunter realize the Cutlass was no longer flying up the river and, in fact, was hardly flying at all. Julia, this is Mitch. What do you have on the FLIR? He continued. And how come we're moving so slow? That's Pesa Killer, said Alvarez. And from the look of it, I'd say it's under attack. I'd say you're right. Have you detected anything else? Some garbled radio transmissions on frequencies used by Bauhaus, Taylor answered in place of Alvarez. Some coded, some in the clear. 
A couple of the emergency locator beacons went off briefly, but everyone's been silent for the last 40 seconds. Ground-based missile fire control radars were also briefly activated. That's what stopped us in the first place. From the sound of this, our target's been hit by a surprise attack, said Hunter, checking the tactical map of the area, as well as the mission log showing the events Taylor described. And a pretty good one. Well, if it ain't us, then who? Bamble asked nervously. Cybertronic? Imperial? You don't want to know who we think it might be. Hunter glanced around the terminal at Wendy. His hard look caused her to stop speaking before the word dark was finished. What about our original operation? Said Sutter. Will you go ahead with it? We'll change it. Julia, this is Mitch. Take us to within ten clicks of the base, then drop us off. Head for your ground holding point and wait there for further orders. Roger, heading for the new drop point, said Julia, advancing the throttles a little and increasing the airspeed by 20 miles an hour. Get your rapple gear ready. Ten kilometers, said Bamble, attaching a metal clamp to his safety harness. That's a lot further than we had discussed at the briefing. We weren't expecting to find the base under attack then, Hunter responded. I'd like to drop us even further out, but we have to reach the target in a reasonable time. Arm weapons, stand by for deployment. Even at this new speed, the CFAH-3 crept along, barely skimming the jungle's upper canopy as it hugged the terrain. It came to a full stop when it slid into a shallow depression where the canopy was partially broken by several fallen trees. Almost at once, the main hatches slid forward and the pylons for the automated repel system snapped out. There were two such pylons for each hatch, and after they were finished extending from the roof, they began unreeling their lines into the jungle. Those squad members nearest the hatch locked their waist clamps around the nylon lines and waited a few more seconds for them to finish dropping. In unison, the first four soldiers pushed off the cabin seats and slid down the lines, using their padded friction gloves to control their descent rate. They dropped into the clearing and were nearly swallowed up by it. They spread out, armed their weapons, and established a perimeter, while the rest of the squad joined them. Last to arrive was Bamble, who slipped off a fallen tree trunk he initially landed on and crashed the last five feet into the jungle's swamp-like floor. He was still picking himself up when the rappel line retracted and the cyclone of rotor wash ended. You delay us like this again, and I'll put Ted behind you and have him kick you out, said Hunter, standing over Bamble while Rogers was helping him to his feet. Raymond, I want you and Wendy to watch over him. Keep him out of my hair. Captain, I know this is a sore point with you, said Bamble, straightening up and promptly sinking into the soft ground. But this attack is something unexpected. A brief report should be sent up the line. You so much as open the lid on that SATCOM unit and I'll feed it to you one precious microchip at a time. Then I'll have you staked out for tiger bait. Don't cross me, Bungle. This op is suddenly a lot more dangerous than I even thought it could be. All right, we move out, heading 191 degrees, south, southwest. Diane, you have the point. Mr. Wood, something's wrong, warned the coordinating officer, intruding on the private discussion the corporate officials were having. There appears to be heavy military activity at Base Aquila, well ahead of schedule. For the last hour, the civilians in the tactical center had been clustered near its administrative desks and entrance. There, the light was better, and the hum of conversation among the military personnel was softened. It allowed Wood to talk freely with the various managers, and it kept Hart from interfering with the operation. Until now. Heavy military activity, Wood repeated, scanning the main screen's tactical map and the information shown on the auxiliary ones. This is combat, 
and looks like one hell of a fight. Well, I can't say I'm not surprised by it, said Hart, a small vindictive smile on his face. Hunter's squad was too undisciplined to have slipped into the target area unnoticed and freed the VIP. They've been discovered and destroyed. I don't believe what we're seeing was caused by them or even involves them, said Varden, turning to look Hart in the eye. Fragmentary transmissions from Base Aquila indicate they're being attacked by several aircraft, not one, and the volume of the fire we're seeing from this distance far exceeds what a lone Special Forces squad can deliver, no matter how well we equip them. I would expect you'd believe that. After all, they're your people. I believe it as well, Mr. Hart, Wood offered, catching the senior military advisor and several other civilian officials off guard. You can't deny what the infrared and radar images are showing. Captain, can you identify the type of aircraft attacking Aquila? We think some are helicopters, said the commander of the radar imaging team. But I'm sorry, we can't be any more specific. What do you mean you can't, said Hart, growing angry. Do you realize what percent of the Army's budget is spent on your training and equipment? Mr. Hart, please. This type of arguing is useless, Wood declared. There must be something better for you to do. Yes, Mr. Wood. Major, open a secure channel to Squad Trident and keep broadcasting a hail until you hear from them. No. Belay that order, Major. After he finished giving his countermand, Wood turned and glowered angrily at Hart. We're to make no attempt to communicate with them. The situation Hunter's squad is in is a lot more dangerous than anything we considered. I don't care what protocols it breaks. We'll wait until they're ready to contact us. Mutant Chronicles Fiction The Apostle of Insanity Trilogy Volume 2 Frenzy by John Allen Price Chapter 8 